I'll go directly to the next slide. Um, we discussed a bit this morning uh, when we compared the requirements, the regulatory requirements between antimicrobial agents and oncology drugs. Um, in the general context, um, for most of the uh, drugs to be approved either by the FDA or the EMEA, uh, for non-oncology drugs, uh, you need multiple studies. The phase three studies are rather large, uh, between 1,000, 5,000, sometimes 20,000 patients. Usually, uh, well, in most cases, you need a placebo control group. Uh, they are almost all double-blinded, and they require to be, uh, for the drug to be approved, that you reach a very highly significant p-value. The case of uh, oncology trials is very different. And it's also what I mentioned this morning is that it may, may very well be, and there is a trend toward that also, that antimicrobial agents will go into towards this direction. Usually, you need only one phase three uh, for approval. Sometimes, quite often, however, uh, two phase threes. But these studies are relatively small in sizes, between 108 and 800 patients. Really, most of them are really between 500 and 800 patients for phase threes, which is very, very small relative to the, to the all other drugs. Most of the time, and that's logical also because it's not ethical to treat cancer patients with a placebo, you have no placebo control, consequence, so no blinding, uh, it's a bit difficult. Sometimes you have a comparator, uh, but it's only sometimes, and most of the time it's a uh, two arms and one arms with no comparator. Um, and it can be a very rather heterogeneous patient group. However, we are trying to, to limit that because it reduces the potency of drug. Uh, and in the end also, uh, you need to have uh, an improvement, but this improvement can be limited. It can be a couple of months. And with the statistical evidence that is uh, significant, of course, but it's 0.05, meaning that to reach this uh, statistical evidence, you need much less patients than with the 0.001. So oncology drugs have to die today, and maybe in the future, antimicrobial agents has benefited from uh, a very favorable environment. Uh, regarding the failure rates, uh, this has led to, uh, to uh, <coughs> Uh, quite a rejection in phase two and phase threes, uh, uh, but that's also the same for anti and other, other drugs. And I would say regulatory authorization, even with these very different requirements, I mean, the rejections are of some of the same level, meaning that's really with a much less, uh, uh, much less stringent uh, requirements, uh, <coughs> I mean, uh, most of the drugs are accepted. Um, basically, you know that in oncology, and here we are really in the clinical, but your work also in the research area is to get to this, because in the end it's based on this that the anti-cancer drugs will be uh, approved. It's mainly overall survival. Sometimes it's uh, progression-free uh, survival, uh, disease-free survival, but the, the PFS and DFS are viewed as surrogates of, of uh, overall survival. It really depends on, on which type of uh, cancer you, you have in. You have guidelines for that, and it's not always that PFS DFS is sufficient for registration. Uh, there is another uh, aspect that is also useful for drug registration, uh, but uh, it's not too much, but sometimes, especially in glioblastoma uh, treatments, it happened that this was used for illustration, is the improvement of, of quality of life. <coughs> also because uh, patients, uh, especially with glioblastoma, maybe you will not cure them, maybe you will not increase their overall survival, but you will so much improve their last months or years of uh, of life that it's, it's, it is considered and it is uh, beneficial. Uh, finally, um, there is a question of, of safety, a benefit risk assessment. So this is always difficult to do. 
uh, requires comparisons, but um, usually, as you don't do uh, controlled clinical trials, it's mainly relative to, uh, to the literature or to, uh, to, to other, uh, to other, um, to other uh, sources of document like the FDA uh, files or uh, European files. And so, basically, the the approval of a, an anti cancer drug. Whereas um, in other trials, you have a really well-defined uh, uh, endpoint with a highly significant uh, uh, statistical uh, difference requirement. It's kind of a go-no-go. No go. In the case of cancer, it's much more also an evaluation of the risk benefits. It's uh, mainly the ODAC in the US, for instance, of the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee. That is evaluating in a way it's sometimes um, gut feeling, I would say. Well, it's a bit more than gut feeling, but it's still somewhat gut feeling. So it's, it's a very, very different context of, of, of registration. And again, as we discussed, this may be the case in a, in a not so far future for, uh, for antibiotics. So, the uh, <clears throat> As, as we saw this morning, there have been a, a couple of breakthroughs. Um, middle end of the 90s, there, was, there were the, uh, the monoclonal antibodies. Middle and, uh, beginning of the 2000s, there have been, been the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, especially, for instance, with Gleevec. And now, since uh, two years, it's uh, the immunotherapy. Actually, but immunotherapy, immunomodulators are not new. The first one to come to, to the market is uh, uh, from uh, Novartis, it's interleukin 2, uh, which has been registered for the treatment of uh, the adenoma, but it has always been considered as a failure, uh, mainly to the fact that uh, it, it has it induces serious adverse effects, events which are actually hypotension. I, I work quite a lot in this uh, arena, so I could talk for hours here. Um, then, from this early 90s uh, up to 2013, uh, there were no immunomodulators. In terms of immunotherapy, there have been monoclonal antibodies, uh, not going very much towards B-spite specific antibodies, but monoclonal antibodies, most of them target other mechanisms that are not really related to the immune response. Uh, they are targeted towards vascularization and other things, or the uh, the ADCC, that is, that they, they kill directly the cells, is that they do not impact, they do not modulate uh, the immune system. And I was very much involved in, uh, until actually one year ago with the interleukin 15, which is a, 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 in its development, but also in trying to find partners for developing it further. And I began that in 2011. At that time, nobody wanted to cure from. Uh, from immunotherapy, even a uh, therapeutic vaccine like a cipulosate uh, T, because it's always been a failure. Everybody failed, and interleukin 2 has been was considered as a failed antibody. So really, nobody wanted to, uh, to understand that. So <coughs> things have dramatically changed in 2013, where the first immunomodulator, Yavoy, has been <coughs> reg registered for treatment metastatic melanoma. What is interesting here is actually that the, the phase three trial, the, the Yervoy, was used as a booster for, for a therapeutic or, or for a peptide that should have acted as a vaccine. And they had three arms, one with the, only with the vaccine, it was called AT100 or something like that, I don't remember. One with the, 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 the vaccine alone, one with uh, Yervoy alone, and one with a combination of the two. And actually, the combination of the two and the avoid alone was very efficient, whereas the vaccine alone was not efficient. So actually, the, the vaccine was useless, and the FDA and the FDA have accepted the results for that for uh, for uh, for registering it. And, and this has been the real start of, of immunomodulators in, in oncology. At that time, or as before, nobody wanted to hear from immunomodulation when I was trying to find partners then everybody wanted to, to have one, but they all wanted antibodies, anti-CDA4, anti-PD1, or anti-PD1, certainly not cytokines, because still we were with the interleukin 2. Then, uh, one year ago, in 2004, uh, 
anti PD1, anti PDL1 have been registered. And today, it's a huge, huge uh, uh, boost in, in, in immunotherapy. Everybody is talking about that. Everybody is trying to find something in this area. Whereas two years before, nobody wanted to hear from that. Now, also saying that, also regarding uh, antibiotics. It's not because today uh, nobody talks about that. It's not because today uh, quite most of the major farmers have exited the, the field that in three or four years they it will not be in a hot area. The industry is made of humans, and the humans are sheep. And if somebody is beginning to has a, has a, has a access to a big a big cage, then everybody else wants to have access to this big cage. So it can be also that in antibiotics in three, four, five, six years, it will be one of the hottest areas in, in, in the pharmaceutical industry. It's not the purpose of this talk, but it's uh, the example of antibiotic um, uh, uh, drugs is, is really interesting. However, um, actually, coming to the uh, immun immunomodulation, actually, we came into, uh, into uh, a, a new paradigm. Um, actually, immunomodulation, their goal is to increase the immune response. It's not to attack directly the cells, to kill the cells, or to attack metabolic, metabolic uh, mechanism of the cells, or to, to attack the, uh, the feeding of the cells. It's really to rescue the immune system, to increase its efficacy. So it's an in indirect uh, mode of action. Uh, however, cancer, and also uh, some infections, especially viral infections, Develop immunosuppressing strategies, uh, and and this by themselves. So they reduce, they uh, they uh, put the immune system uh, asleep, and they really reduce their its uh, their uh, its efficacy. And for vaccines, that has a, a terrific uh, co uh, <laughs> consequences that uh, they lose their efficacy, or at least it, it's much more uh, reduced. However, to counter uh, to counter this immunosuppressing mechanism. Now, uh, what is really hot is the immunomodulators, which are there to reboost the immune system. And there are two ways of doing it. One, which is with the an antibodies, checkpoint inhibitors, is to block the immune uh, regulation, down regulation mechanism. I mean, the immune system is, is mainly. And, and I would say, in a, uh, simplistically, in a way, it, it is balanced. I mean, you have the T-Rex, and the T-Rex can either <coughs> reduce the immune system or increase the immune system depending on, on the needs. So there, there is a regulation mechanism in, 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 the, in, in, in the body. And what, what these, uh, what these uh, antibodies, the checkpoint inhibitors, do is that they block this uh, uh, this uh, control mechanism. It's as if if you have, if you have a car, uh, just the uh, for instance, the cancer would put uh, put a weight on the on the brake. So you can increase the pressure on on the gas pedal. The car will go fast a bit faster, but not too much. Um, and, and and so it, it cannot kill the the, the, the cancer. And this this. Um, these uh, drugs, actually, what they do is they uh, they, uh, they block the, the pressure on, on, on the gas, so <coughs> there is no brake or only a, a limited brake. So you, the car can speed up very much. The downside of it is, is that it can it can overspeed. So <coughs> that's that's a bit uh, <coughs> a bit different. The cytokines, even at, uh, cytokines, either they do the same, or in other cases, in some cases, but these drugs are not yet so very much different, can bypass the mechanism of immunosuppression. To give you an example I've worked on is interleukin 15. I don't have a graph here, <coughs> but <coughs> in order to be uh, efficient, Interleukin-15 has to dock on, on CD8 and, 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 and A cells. 
But before doing so, it has to do also on, on, uh, on a receptor, which is called the R-alpha, on, on the dendritic cells, on presenting cells, in order to exert its full activity. And what happens in cancer situations, or viral infection uh, uh, situations, is that there is a peptidic cleavage and a gene silencing of this R-alpha <coughs> in the dendritic cells. So you have <coughs> you have circulating interleukin-15, but which is not primed anymore, that will dock to the uh, CD8 and NK cells, but will not be able to exert its full activity. What this company has done is that it has identified the smallest part of this R-alpha receptor that is necessary for this full activity, and they made a fusion protein between interleukin-15 and this small receptor. So what you inject is a primed, a primed interleukin-15. Yeah, but you don't attach to the regulation mechanism. You just bypass the immunosuppressive mechanism. And that's very interesting. That's a future or so. Because when you bypass, actually, you don't block the break. You don't block anything. You are just putting the, 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 uh, the situation to a normal situation. You are just boosting the immune system to its normal activity. That's for the presentation of the different strategies. So, as I mentioned, the main mechanism of action, which is very different from any other anti-cancer drugs, is the stimulation of the immune cells. So this has consequences. First, as it is kind of a, well, it's an immune reaction, it's an inflammatory in, uh, reaction. So you have first an invasion of the tumor by immune cells and an immune reaction. Uh, and we will see the consequences of that. Uh, also, it's, it's, it's very efficient so towards very different types of tumors, but probably not very efficient when you have a relatively big blood tumor. And in that case, and that the future of it is certainly combination between classical anti-cancer agents and immunotherapy. It's probably much more, and almost certainly much more efficacious on cancer-initiating cells, residual diseases and metastasis, and certainly much more than classical agents. And these cells are those who are responsible for relapses and, and metastasis. And in the end, it's those cells that are killing the, 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 the body. That's why we hope that with, uh, with the immunomodulators and combination of immunomodulators and, and other uh, anti-cancer uh, uh, approaches, we are going towards a cure because we kill the main body of the cancer, but at the same time we care uh, what makes it uh, recurrent or metastatic and that what leads to, 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 to the death. Um, <clears throat> but there are there is uh, certainly more efficacious, but uh, there is a downside is that it costs a lot and the other cancer cancer treatments cost a lot, so it's beginning to be a real health problem as well. Uh, society problem. The good thing is that we can hope in a relatively near future, and at least in some can types of cancer, that we have a potential of cure for quite a good percentage of patients. Then uh, the, uh, the 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 thing is that <coughs> uh, there are challenges in developing immunotherapy. First, uh, the, 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 lab, uh, the lab assays are not very well uh, harmonized, and it can be very variable from, from a lab to another. The second thing is that, as I mentioned, it's a novel pattern of anti-immune response. As I mentioned, you have an invasion of the, of the cancer cells, and we'll see that, meaning that at, at the beginning, instead of having a re reduction of your cancer, you have the impression that the cancer expands. And, uh, and, and this also results uh, in, in the survival curves that can show delayed separation, meaning that the immunomodulators, uh, immuno the response, the clinical response to immunomodulators is delayed. It's much delayed. Uh, here is an example of interlaboratory viability. You see that it's for, for three classical tests of the immune response. It's very, very variable, and uh, that's, that's the same. Oh, no, sorry, that's the same. So what they have done now is that they 
they have been uh, editing new stocks that are trying to, to reduce the uh, interlaboratory variability. Uh, here is uh, an example of new response patterns. Patterns, sorry. <coughs> In black, uh, um, that's that's coming from from uh, epidemiomab uh, epidemi study. And what you see here is that with immunotherapy, you have first either a stability of the the, 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 the no change from the baseline or increase uh, from the baseline in the in the tumor size. Same here and same here. Uh, this leads to uh, and what what you also see usually is that uh, at, at the beginning between immunotherapy and uh, another treatment or no treatment there is no difference but the difference comes begins to come after a couple of months. Whereas if with other anti-cancer agents, the, the curves and as we see are, are much much more like this. And this is new. And this this is was not good at the time of, a, of the first development of, of the first uh, anti-cancer immunomodulators. And actually one of them has failed, which is called Tremeline Map, because we didn't know that. Here is an example of a clinical uh, trial uh, tri uh, in 227 patients with epilimumab. And uh, um, uh, here we are looking at the size of the tumors. And, and because, you know, uh, the way it's not overall survival, it's organic boundary, it's the evolution of the type, the size of the tumor. tumor. If you use the classical, uh, the classical, uh, um, how we say that, uh, classical criteria, uh, for uh, for efficacy, uh, uh, the uh, which is uh, I mean you look at the evolution of, 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 the, of the tumor. What you see is that you have a relatively flat evolution, and meaning that your drug is not really uh, not really uh, uh, is relatively uh, sorry is relatively efficient. But you cannot distinguish really from patients who really benefit from from the drug, whereas they have used uh, a new criteria where you are not looking at, at the size of the tumors at the beginning. You're not considering uh, it as a pro uh, uh, progressive disease so that you, you can see the differentiation relatively rapidly. The, uh, <coughs> this is an example of, um, of uh, with another antibody. It's an anti, uh, anti uh, another, uh, sorry, you know, moderator. It's an anti-PD-1, anti -PD anti -PD and what you see in that is the OS, uh, overall survival rate uh, with uh, with uh, <coughs> when you you consider uh, complete response, uh, partial response, and uh, and stable disease disease um, by resist and this criteria, you get a, a very good response, and you have the dissociation. Within, within the next couple of six months, but not before. Um, another example of here is, is the same. Um, here, it's patient's overall survival, and here is uh, non-progressive disease by the resist and uh, this, uh, new, uh, this new criteria. So you see that you have a very good survival prediction here, whereas if you uh, you um, consider uh, the progressive disease by RESIS, which is the classical uh, method evaluation, and non-progressive disease by uh, uh, by the new criteria. You have a, a, a lesser good uh, response, but it's uh, pretty protective. Finally, if you have a PD by both criteria, you you, you will that. So. Um, what I wanted to mean, and this is kind of a, also important in early stage uh, developments, is that uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the classical way of evaluating the efficacy of a drug, even in in, uh, in preclinical models, have to be different for immunotherapy. First of all, um, as a mechanism of action is through the uh, the stimulation of the immune system, you have to be much more uh, uh, 
uh, cautious on the results you obtain on, on the immune cells in your in vivo experiments or in the clinics. Second, um, classically, for instance, uh, for, uh, for melanoma, you will use a B16, F10 model. Uh, classically, you will look at the evolution of the size. Mortality is, is a bit less, but especially at the number and the size of the tumors. And you may wrongly consider that your immunomodulator agent is, is not efficient because you have increased the number and the size of the tumors at the big, very beginning during the first one or two months. And then the decrease appears only after that. And depending on which countries, you have to kill the, 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 the mice after, after a certain delay, which might be too short, actually, for observing the efficacy uh, of, of your drug. And of course, if you look at the, um, at, at the survival, you have to keep the, the, these mice uh, or the, patient, well, the patients different because you don't sacrifice them, but at least to keep the mice uh, alive long enough to really observe the efficacy of the, uh, of the immunotherapy. So, um, so in, in, in consequence of what has been done uh, now is uh, uh, they have uh, set up a, a actually kind of a help in, in for the translation of the immune response into survival, and it's, uh, they have uh, improved the uh, the, uh, the the models and um, uh, also regarding the response, there is the classical who and resist criteria, where uh, where new uh, measure, measurable uh, lesions have represent always represent a progressive disease, and you have uh, criteria that are adapted for immunotherapy where new lesions or uh, increase in uh, in the size of a of, of a tumor uh, is not considered as a, uh, as, a, as a progressive disease, but you need to look uh, later on. Well, these are the main references that you can uh, look at if you are interested by the subject. The, the, the most progressive one is that one from the Bulls, which is a very good one, and, uh, and, and uh, that's uh, all the discussions. But really, what I wanted to mean here is that there is a change. Um, regarding the, what I mentioned with map, which is, was a Pfizer drug, which was coming before the map from BMS. map is the first immunotherapeutic drug that came to the market. During the first quarter, it, uh, the sales were five times more than what the company expected. Currently, I don't remember how much it sales it sells, but it's over, I think, close to two billion. Just before that, Pfizer had also an anticipated A4, which is not a bad one, but it failed in the phase in the phase three because they stopped the phase three. They had an, an intermediate point to see if there was a potential benefit, and they saw that there was no benefit, so they stopped the study. But as the patients were treated and by by um, they, they, they went on, when, and then they stopped the program actually, but they went on observing the patients, treating them because they were, it was mandatory. And what they observed one or two years after is that actually the drug is very efficient and there was a significant increase in overall survival. So sometimes you really have to change the paradigms. Uh, regarding uh, antibiotics, maybe true too, I don't know enough of that, but maybe if there are some impacts or good news with immunotherapy in, in, in uh, antibiotics, this is something that should also be considered. Thank you very much. Uh, you gave uh, uh, real academic talk. Sorry. You gave an academic talk, so we feel like students could learn a lot from your talk. And even for myself, you clarified a lot of dilemmas I have in treating HIV patients and AIDS. Mm -hmm. And the leukemia 2 was used also in yeah. AIDS patients in huge studies of 6,000 patients for six years. And they sustained that could have a good effect because they increased the CD4 count. However, the patients had a lot of bacterial infections. And in fact, the CD4 count was increased because all the lymphocytes was inc were increased. Mm -hmm. But the percentage of CD4, it was the same okay. per the hour. 
So it was nonsense, but we had a lot of discussion and I lost many of my friends because I didn't agree with them. Now it's up to you to, to ask questions and uh, take this opportunity to have someone who knows very well the subject. About that, yeah. Yes, I'm yes. Paul Park. I'd like to know your opinion about the personalized medicine, personalized treatment. Personalized medicine. Yes. Uh, so, you think it's a trend or it's? Um, it's been a dream. It still is a dream. Mm -hmm. um, regarding um, and it's something that we also discussed a bit this morning. I mean, personalized medicine and diagnostics is somewhat the same. Because you have the diagnostic, or the well, in a way, you have the identification of, a, of an individual who will most benefit from the drug. So it's some of the same area. It can be clinical science, but of course, can also be a diagnostic. So it, it, it's a drip. It's really what uh, what could make the things very efficient. First, it, uh, as I mentioned this in this morning, it reduces the cost and size of the clinical trials because you select the patients who can benefit from it. So it reduces the cost of development. We will not reduce the cost of the product, but we will re reduce the cost to the to the community. We will reduce also. Uh, we should reduce also the uh, <coughs> the, uh, the the risk of resistance because it will not be spread out. Um, and and lots of efforts have been done towards that. For the time being, it's not that successful. But um, I will moderate my comment because. Actually, this already exists since a couple of time, some time. For instance, for breast cancer, yeah. uh, it's personalized medicine because you have HER2 positive patients. Grivex to say it's Philadelphia plus patients. So it's already personalized in a way, well, it's, yeah, it's personalized medicine uh, for, uh, <coughs> for uh, I don't remember which one, uh, which is an anti cancer agent from Rush. It's a big city. Uh, uh, B600 mutant uh, uh, melanoma, so it's it's personalized towards the type of cancer, narrowing down uh, the, uh, the 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 the, the cause. And, and quite a lot, and more and more, the drugs uh, uh, are effic efficacious towards certain sub I would say suspicious of mutants of, of of cancers, and are very efficient. And we know that it's useless to give them to do that. So quite a lot of treatments now, you have biopsy, but you have also uh, uh, a screening of, 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 the, of the, 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 the species, the subspecies it is, to know which one you give to So it's, it's, really, um, it's really very, very attractive. It's also really attractive because um, Uh, but, uh, but at some point, the, 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 the thing is also is that uh, yeah, you may have 20% of, of, of mutants, but what do you do with the, the rest? For instance, in, in melanoma, with the B16, uh, Vera Verum family, uh, I don't remember, from Russia that came on the market in 2012, it was considered as a huge improvement, blah, blah, blah. but it was only for 45% of the patients. What, what do you do with the 45, 55? Uh, what is interesting with immunotherapy is that you don't care about that. You just don't care. Because uh, immunotherapy, I'm talking general immunotherapy, I mean, the immune system is able to develop itself. Because when you are going with immunotherapy, you don't, you don't attack the specific negative, whatever you trigger, you stimulate the immune system. And the immune system is very sensitive and very able to be planned to, to adapt itself to, to the attack. So, in, yeah, it's always it's still a dream. Um, it's more than a dream today because I would say that 20 or 30 percent at least in oncology are already personalized medicine and it's threats that will go on. Uh, but then it, it's also the question of the trust and uh, it's nice to have personalized medicine that could become a, a negative medicine which means that only some patients could benefit uh, from it. So better to combine the immune therapy and the personalized uh, the, the, the future is, is for the combination, certainly, certainly, certainly.
Any other questions?